this person has a deal for that much money. She. I was actually looking at it in Brazil. No, so it's, 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 it's almost 2 billion rand two if you want to call it. Trans. Yes. Those are big numbers to talk about. I have never bought into the idea that Africans are incapable. In fact, I subscribe to the notion that for the world to, um, to progress and succeed, Africa has, yes. to do, has, has to progress and succeed and only an African can do that. If your character is problematic, we will not back you because every business goes through challenges and you need to be humble enough firstly to know as an entrepreneur that just because you came up with a business idea and started the business doesn't mean you know everything. True. Sure. I promised a couple of friends of mine a while back that I would be bringing a mentor, a woman that we respect so much from TV. But today, this is not TV. We get to learn from the one and only, a judge in the Dragon's Den, CEO of IDF. And this is where we're shooting from. Welcome, Webola. <laughs> so much. Don't don't say I'm from TV. <laughs> but it's it's interesting when we see you there and then we get to see you in person. Mm. And I have so many questions. One of which is I think we can start here. It's women's month. Mm. You speak a lot about why it's so important to empower women. Mm. Because I went to Rwanda. Mm. And the first lady there said something that really hit home for me. Mm. It was just looking at it mathematically. Mm. She said, a nation cannot bet its future on the talent of half its population. Mm. And nations that focus on men are doing it regularly. That. Mm. What do you think? What's your view and word of inspiration in Women's Month? Well, I mean, it's, it, it defies logic that um, I, I often use the analogy of a football match. It defies logic to go onto the football pitch with half of your team <laughs> and expect <laughs> to win, right? That's really the, the long and the short of it. Mm. Uh, but I think uh, just from an economic impact perspective, um, we probably all know the stats that say that um, for every one brand that is in the hands of a woman, Mm. It is split nine ways. Okay. Uh, it impacts, you know, it goes towards health, education, clothing, food, you know, the basics, um, even extended family, right? Yeah. So this, the so socioeconomic impact of empowering women is very, very significant. The, you know, the other view, uh, <laughs> and our male counterparts say, they, 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 they take 70 cents out of the rent for themselves. <laughs> and then the 30... I was wondering what was the, behind that smile. And then, <laughs> and then the 30 cents is the one that is shared. So the, 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 the socioeconomic impact, therefore, yeah. is significantly diminished uh, when you focus attention on, on, on men. Okay. Yeah. When it comes to that dynamic, when you, you've traveled around Africa, what do you okay. think, what do you see? And where are we with it as a continent when it comes to supporting women? I mean, you mentioned Rwanda. Yeah. So Rwanda for me uh, is one of the shining examples of, uh, and I don't use the term empowerment uh, because it sounds like you're doing people a favor, but really creating a platform for women's potential uh, to be unlocked uh, so that broader society can benefit. So, so they're certainly doing very well. I mean, it's visible. Yeah. Um, the statistics, however, suggest that South Africa is actually ahead of the pack. Is it? Yes. And McKenzie did a study. Um, in fact, I was in Rwanda when they launched that study, <laughs> uh, the, the, the report rather, in 2019, where South Africa is ahead of, of, of the pack, or it was ahead of the pack in 2019. I haven't um, kept uh, up to speed as to how, you know, those trends are, are moving. Okay. Um, but interestingly, you know, we also do work in Lesotho. And some years ago, we were looking at uh, just understanding the level of inequality between men and women, uh, uh, entrepreneurs in Lesotho. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, we worked with the, uh, the equivalent of the IDC in the sort of called uh, the Lesotho, well, it's LNDC. Okay. So um, they actually said that they had done a study with the, with the World Bank and the World Bank found that Lesotho's women entrepreneurs are actually probably some of the, the most empowered. I'm hoping that the work that you do at IDF Capital has also had an impact. Yeah. Uh, and I know that there's been quite a bit of push uh, towards um, uh, cre- creating opportunities yeah, for women. So, um, and, and supporting women. So, so the, the World Bank study that was done on Lesotho with the, with the LNDC actually suggested that um, women in Lesotho actually got the majority of financial and non-financial support. So that was interesting for me. Uh, but when you look at, you know, things like the Mc- McKinsey reports, they don't mm. really focus on smaller countries like Lesotho. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 and then you go to Zambia, um, again, from me, upon observation, I don't have statistics to back this, but just yeah. observing the ecosystem there, I find that there's a lot of um, entrepreneurial activity by women uh, in those countries. So women actually, um, according to the African Development Bank, make up more than 40% of entrepreneurs on the African continent. So women are actually pulling the their majority, weight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, not majority, but we, we are almost 50-50 in terms yeah. of activity. But only 2%, according to the African Development Bank, only 2% yeah. of funding goes towards women-owned entrepreneurs. That is meaning very low. Exactly, uh, sorry, women-owned businesses. So meaning that... Uh, the let's say the fifty percent of the population gets ninety eight percent of the support, and and uh, the other fifty percent has to, um, you know, make a plan, which also talks to the resilience of women because, despite the fact that very little financial support goes towards women, mm. we still are almost fifty percent of total entrepreneurship of the continent in terms of SME entrepreneurship. At least I'm not yeah. about big business. Big business is a matter of all together. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. When you look at your New York area, would you say uh, one or two women that have impacted you to get to this point? Um, so they're not in my profession. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I I often okay. So I'm a I'm a we are in in a boardroom called uh, Queen Manta DC. Oh, okay. Uh, and I did a TED talk some years ago about Queen Manta DC, uh, who was a pathfinder in the 1800s, early 1800s. Oh, okay. He played the role of the chief of a tribe called the Batrogwa um, as a regiment. So not a regiment, what do they call them? Anyway, she was standing uh, in for her yeah. son because the son was, was, was young. And for me, she represented a boldness. Mm-hmm. She represented um, a new way of thinking and doing things because women were not chiefs in those days. At what stage um, in your career did you come across her? Um, I've always known about her. Is it? Yeah, well, f- from history. Remember, yeah. in high school when you're doing history, yeah. So I've always known about her, but I did not studied her as deeply as I've sort of done in, in the recent past. But I've always been uh, inspired by, by women uh, first. Um, and then... The one person that also, for me, has been a great deal of inspiration was Winnie Mandela. Because Winnie Mandela, uh, just, mm-hmm. you know, defied all odds, right? Uh, she sacrificed her, her, her well-being, her life, her happiness mm-hmm. for the greater good. Um, she was bold. She believed that nothing was impossible. Um, so I've always been inspired by, by women who, who sort of go against, um, you know, what the norms are and yeah. break new, uh, barriers. Um, so, so yeah, there are very many women, but those are the two you asked me for two. So yeah, no, I two. asked for two. <laughs> and certainly I think Owini is an inspiration for mm. many. Mm. When you look at your journey as an entrepreneur, mm. one thing someone asked me, a young person actually was saying, when you, I, it, the stage of your career that you're in. At a young age, did you see that you would come this far? My mother will tell you that at the age of 17, I told her that I'm going to be a multimillionaire. How? <laughs> it was always clear for you. That was the intention. What made you be that person? Did you see the opportunities 
Were you raised? Were you exposed to opportunities? Because I imagine we grow up in different worlds. There are people that grow up in areas that are not resourced. The quality of education is not that great. So it's a bit harder for them to think in that way. Although some do. I read a lot. You read uh, a lot. Yeah, I was a bookworm. Uh, if you wanted to know anything about anything, you would come to me because I probably would have read about it. So I lived um, through books. I traveled the world through books. So I was very fortunate in that my, uh, my father's aunt used to be a domestic worker. Okay. Uh, for the European uh, family. So when they decided to go back to Europe, they had a library of books because they had children. So they then gifted them to my, to my, my, my great aunt. Mm. Uh, and my great aunt lived with my father. So I literally would not leave the house and read all these books. So I was, you know, on some days I'd be somewhere in England okay. uh, and through the books, you know, or somewhere in the U.S. through the books. So, and that was important. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's, that's what really shaped me. But I also read a lot of magazines. In particular, uh, I used to read People Magazine. I don't know whether it's still there. But People I, Magazine... I'm not sure now. Yeah, but People Magazine used to... It was very America-focused. Yes. And um, what struck me was that... And it, 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 it focused a lot on people in the entertainment industry, uh, which, which tended to be black. Mm -hmm. Or at least there were a lot of black people in the entertainment Indeed. industry there. So for me, I saw black success. You know, I read about, in fact, the first time I heard about Oprah Winfrey was through People magazine. Mm -hmm. And the work that she was doing uh, to, to, to support, uh, you know, poor communities and uh, the wealth that she created for herself. So for me, it was always a possibility because um, I, I, I wasn't confined to my physical, you know, a place of, 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 of living. Uh, my, my, my head was always outside of where I am physically. Okay. Uh, but I also uh, have been very fortunate that my family generally are entrepreneurs and the women. Oh, so this is not something that started with just you. No, no, no. I come from generations of entrepreneurs. I'm the third generation. Third, yes. My grandfather and then his children. And then, so I'm third generation entrepreneur. Would you say that gave you an advantage in the marketplace? Yes, because it was not a foreign concept to me. I, I, I could see it. Uh, it. It was a lived experience. So, and it's important, the question you are asking, because um, I'm very big on role models. Yeah. Because we come from a background where we didn't have very many good or successful no, role models. Uh, people don't have, you know, the notion of what it looks like to uh, to to be a successful entrepreneur not many people so um i i had the privilege of seeing uh, my aunts in particular there's a particular aunt who inspired me to be an entrepreneur um she's in her 70s she's still an entrepreneur okay you know so so uh, so for me that that's probably the added uh, advantage, advantage i have as well um but i think more than that, it is, it is the actual reading. I, I used to immerse myself uh, in books. I, I could visualize, uh, you know, when I said to my mother, I'm going to be a multimillionaire at 17, it's because I was reading about the Eddie Murphys of this world, you know, the, as I said, the Oprah Winfrey's of this world who were, who were multimillionaires. So I was like, okay, so it's possible for a black person to be a multimillionaire. Uh, and if it's Oprah, black woman. Exactly, then. right. So um, I've just always had that conviction that we are capable Mm -hmm. Okay, love it. And then when you look at your journey as an entrepreneur, building the Bizui CIDF, yeah. did you have businesses that you started that failed along the way? Or you are one of those that get it right first time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I started, I started my first little business when I was in high school. Uh, I used to sell, you know, sweet snacks. Okay. Things that kids love. Yeah. Um, because uh, I wanted to have pocket money and my mother did not allow us to have pocket money. She mm. said, if she's got scuffed in, That's it. Yeah, yeah, you're sorted. What are you going to do with money? You're going to buy silly things. So maybe I've always liked money. So I, <laughs> I found ways of, of, of trading money for myself. Uh, so I suppose that business died when I finished high school. Yeah. Um, and then when I was... Uh, 
employed. Um, I then bought a property to run a BNB. Okay. That failed. And, <laughs> and it failed for very basic reasons. Uh, I didn't understand that a lifestyle business requires the owner to be there all the time. Yeah. That's just the nature of lifestyle yeah. businesses. You cannot outsource a lifestyle business mm. to people uh, because it's very personal. That's straight up my search. Yeah. 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 Um, so I then learned that the next venture I start, it has to be a business that can run while I'm sleeping. Okay. So this is the business that I, I, I well, I'm getting there. I, I'm, I'm still here all the time, but I'm getting to a point where it if I can runs. go off for 12 months, it's a, it's a, it's a corporation who's corporatized it now. You know, it's no longer a, a one man show. It was a one man show for a very long time. And now I've got a team, I've got executives, I've got a board, and I've got people who do the work. And have a yeah, and I've seen some of them. They're amazing, <laughs> good people. <laughs> when I read, there's an article I read about you and they were saying you had just closed a deal and I saw the number on the agents, like 100 million, I think. 102 million US dollars. Oh, you know, you see now. <laughs> No, it was so, a fund. It was a fund. Um, so, so the way do you want me to explain to you how we work? I want to know how IDF works. Mm -hmm. But before that, I wanted to know your relationship with money. Mm. How how you developed it to a level where where you are now, mm -hmm. and you will tell us where where you are. Because when I see, or when many people see that this person has a deal for that much money, she. I was actually looking at it in rands. Even. No, it's, 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 it's almost 2 billion rand. Two if you want to convert it. billion rands. Yes. Trans are big numbers to talk about. Right. And not many people can conceptualize working at that level of life because of the relationship we have with money when you're growing up as blacks in black communities. We don't, we're not used to talking big numbers. How does someone help develop that relationship with money so they get comfortable with just dreaming at a higher level than where they are. Well, my view of money is that money firstly is not evil. <laughs> oh, it's not the root of all evil, <laughs> as, as we have been socialized to believe. Um, I believe that wealth and money is an enabler. Yeah. Right. So that's how I see it. I don't see yeah. money as, oh, you know, it's going to come into my pocket one day and I'm going to buy myself nice things. Money is mm -hmm. power. Uh, money enables you to change things, to, in, to be impactful. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, um, so my political ideology is, is Pan-Africanism. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I have never bought into the idea that Africans are incapable. In fact, I subscribe to the notion that for the world to um, to to progress and succeed, Africa has mm -hmm. to do, has has to progress and succeed, and only an African can do that. That's how, maybe that's how arrogant I am as an African. Mm -hmm. I believe that we are central to the success of 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 of, of this world, the world, right? Um, and therefore, I, I I believe that the lie that we have been told over centuries that we are less intelligent, we are incapable, we are lazy. We're often told that South Africans are lazy and things like that. I don't subscribe mm. to all of that. I think mm. it's nonsense. And um, so the only way that, uh, maybe not the only way, but one of the ways uh, that I can prove that philosophy true is by ensuring that I've got sufficient resources to drive that change, that development of our, of our, of our continent. We need to be very intentional about developing the economy of this continent, because we are the richest mm -hmm. continent. Continent. God gave, you know, God in bestowed us. Yeah, he, he bestowed us the best resources in the world, and we've never benefited uh, from them. The world has benefited from them, not us. Yeah. So we need to start at home. We need to bring the money here. We need to take it back. I get it. It went out. <laughs> it went so out. now we are, we are bringing it back. The hundred and two million US dollars that I'm talking about, half of it came from. Uh, the Americas and, and the Euros, right? And the other half likely came from the continent. But we need to be very intentional about bringing that money back and developing our continent so that Africa can rise for Africans. Powerful. And 
when this money is here, the idea is here, how do you then do this empowerment? So, um, so maybe let me explain our business model. Firstly, IDF Capital, as it currently stands, is primarily, we, we call ourselves a financial services boutique firm, right? Okay. And uh, we then, within that, that, that boutique firm, we've got different businesses. So the one that I'm going to talk about now is our fund management business, right? And essentially, when you run a fund management business, you go out, uh, well, you first uh, develop an investment uh, thesis that says, um, if I invest so much money in such and such areas, then this is what the benefit will be for everybody. The benefit yes. for, the, for the investors, but the benefit for the entrepreneurs, the benefit for society, the benefit for our economy. So we go out, uh, so, so we call it a, 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 an investment memorandum. So you go out and you, you, you then convince people with lots of money <laughs> to, 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 to allow you to manage their money. So the money that we raise, it's not my money. So I'm not working around it with two I billion, 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 billion in your pocket. No, it's not my money. Uh, I just convinced people to allow me to manage two billion rand uh, by saying to them that um, the other 50% that has not gone into the football field, we need to bring them in. And uh, this is what uh, the impact is going to be on society, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so, 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 so that's really how it works. And then we then look at, uh, for opportunities that uh, will uh, give us um, investment returns, high, higher returns in particular, because okay. you know, everybody's competing for money. So one way that you compete is to demonstrate that if you give me one rand today, I'll give it back to you as three rand in five years' time. Essentially, yeah. that, that's the story that's, I, I go around point. telling them that give me one rand, I'll give it back to you as three rent in five years' time. So I then go out and look for business opportunities that will make true that, <laughs> that uh, you know, if I now give you... One brand will be three. Exactly, yeah. So that's why, um, you know, so we're commercial, but we also are impactful in um, us being commercial. I don't believe that uh, you should be giving money for free because... People don't value free things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you also want to prove the concept uh, and the philosophy that um, we, we are capable of running, of building and running sustainable businesses that can become the Anglo-Americans of this world, that can become the standard banks of this world, right? Yes. So that's what we are saying. Yeah. Remember, remember that, <laughs> that, that, that political ideology I, yeah. I, I shared with you? That's by an Africanism. Yeah, exactly. That uh, Africans can, can make it too. It's just that we've been stolen from for so many years that we've mm -hmm. never had a chance to actually prove ourselves. So, so I look for businesses that dream big like me. You know, we don't do, uh, I mean, look, we also do do some, you know, nascent businesses where we give people a chance. But in the main, we're looking for people who are like, I'm trying to build the next Standard Bank, or I'm trying to build the next Anglo-American, I'm trying to build the next, you know, first rent group or whatever it is, uh, if, if we can. Um, and uh, we also recognize the fact that your typical African woman, uh, because she has not uh, had opportunity to, or rather has not uh, gotten the kind of support, financial uh, support that they need to grow their businesses, yeah. We typically find them at a very early stage. So most investors prefer to invest at a later stage. Established business. Exactly, because, it, you know, it's less risky. You know, um, there's a, le a level of certainty around the type of returns they will make. Yeah. But our, you know, our the, 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 the entrepreneurs that we, we tend to focus on, which is mainly African women, but we also do African men as well. Mm -hmm. And they, they tend to be at a very early stage of their businesses, which is fairly risky. Right. So we, we have uh, a higher risk appetite than most investors, okay. but we are not reckless. Right. That I know. Yes. I remember. <laughs> we are not reckless. We, uh, so, so, so we, we do a very thorough due diligence. Mm -hmm. uh, we ask very tough questions. Uh, so we're not very popular with very many people, <laughs> but we're not trying to be popular. We're trying to build the Africa. economy of this mm -hmm. continent. Um, and, and we have backed uh, some really good businesses. You know, we've backed, we just recently backed a company called Alma Clinics, uh, okay. which is run by a, a lady called Sprungile uh, uh, Ras, uh, who grew up in Soweto okay. and is, is using technology to, 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 to enable access to, to, to primary health care. 
wow. across the country, right? Okay. Uh, so, so, so for me, that's impactful. It will benefit the majority of South Africans who, who do not have access to primary health care. Mm. She's delivering it at a much cheaper price than, you know, what you would have to pay if you had to go to a doctor. But she, you get, you know, uh, first world service. I mean, if, if, you, if you can look at the Alma Clinic uh, facilities, mm. uh, there's one in Pinville, there's one in Midlands, there's one in Cosmo City. Okay. But you'd swear that, and, and they, we've got one now in, in Rivonia that we launched about two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, and then we launched one this Saturday, Pack Station. They all look the same, regardless of where they are. So you get first world service at a fraction of the price, right? Which is great. I'm mm -hmm. curious about one thing, though. When you find these businesses, there's good businesses that are where an opportunity to scale, how mm -hmm. far do you go in mentoring them? Because you identify that there is a risk. We are very, very hands-on. So I'm a very busy woman. <laughs> <laughs> We're very hands-on. Um, you, you, um, very hands-on. We, we, of course, are careful not to try and run those businesses for the entrepreneurs because we yeah. don't want to create a dependency. But we're very hands-on. I mean, um, just now before uh, this discussion, um, I was on a call with uh, one of my colleagues who we was just reflecting on a, a business that we invested in. Okay. Uh, so, you know, even sometimes... Uh, you know, no, no amount of due diligence is going to show you all the hokakis. <laughs> so we did a transaction on the face of it. It looked nice. They put on nice lipstick on it. <laughs> so once we had parted with our money and we settled, we started sitting on the board. So we sit on, on, on the boards of the companies we invest in. Mm -hmm. Then we started asking questions and scratching. And then once we start scratching, you see, hey, there are problems here. Uh, and one of them literally was uh, going to, 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 it was almost going into business uh, rescue. So we literally stepped in, uh, cleaned up, got rid of the management team, brought in new that management, uh, brought in uh, a, an external service provider to come and help us uh, determine the, the, the extent of the rot and therefore what corrective measures we need to take. We then, you know, helped to implement that. So we literally, so th this particular company, we literally, uh, uh, the, the last year I was spending two days out of five days there on every week, Ooh. right? Now I don't do that anymore. I'm going there now. Uh, I'm going to be there just for half a day today. Well, that's a big benefit having you there even for one day, I guess. Yeah. So, so, so we, we get that involved. We help with mm -hmm. uh, developing strategy. Some of the businesses that we invest in, you know, um, are cash hungry because they're um, scaling. Mm -hmm. So we are, you know, we are investment professionals. So we will go and talk to other investors. We will help um, negotiate. Uh, again, the first meeting I had this morning, we were negotiating um, an agreement that this business is trying to get into with another financier, where we had been pushing back to say, no, these terms are not for the, you know, they, 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 they'll be detrimental to this business that we're invested in. Yeah. So we help the entrepreneurs to understand what the implications of some of the financial terms are in the contracts that they are presented with. We help to negotiate. Because uh, some don't read those. As, as, or sometimes you read and you think you understand, but mm. you don't really understand until the day that the people now start telling you about their rights, <laughs> you know, and, and because we've done so many, I mean, we funded more than 300 businesses. So we, we, we've drafted lots of legal agreements. We've read lots of legal agreements. We've negotiated lots of legal, legal agreements. So we come with a lot of that experience mm. collectively. Um, so, so we see ourselves as value adding investors, uh, because we want to enhance the chances of success of every business that we invest in. Sure. But it also means that we are very tough uh, shareholders, right? So we have very, very robust engagements with entrepreneurs that we back. So if someone is coming, they need to be ready to be accountable. They have to be accountable. I only say that if we pick up that you don't have a teachable spirit uh, when we're doing our due diligence, we're not going to give you money. It doesn't matter how great the idea the is idea. or the business is. If your character is problematic. We will not back you because every business goes through challenges and you need to, you need to be willing, you need to be humble enough firstly to know as an entrepreneur that just because you came up with a business idea and started the business doesn't mean you know everything. Sure. There are very many things that you do not know. And we are also not coming in saying that we know everything, but we're saying that there are certain things we know that you might not know. 
So work with us. And, and certain resources you have. Yes, exactly. And where both you as an entrepreneur and I as an investor don't know, let us, let's go out and look for people who know better than us, right? So a lot of entrepreneurs then have this, oh, this is my baby. They're holding on to it. And I'm like, dude, it's one rand. So you're holding on <laughs> uh, to 100% of one rand. And I'm trying to make your one rand a thousand rand. So if I eat Do you to, see a lot of that? Uh, where an entrepreneur is afraid to give equity because they want 100% of their business. They want to keep you at a distance. Give me a loan and stay away from my business. Yes, uh, there, there's a lot of that. But uh, I mean... Even I, mean, I as an entrepreneur, uh, I'm an entrepreneur myself. I don't <laughs> want to give away equity unless it's absolutely necessary. Well, I think that is valuable to it. So, I, I mean, I understand that. Yes. Um, but sometimes you do need to allow yourself to bring in more brains around the table to help you to grow this thing. So it depends on your level of uh, ambition, I think. Yeah. So if you are very ambitious um, and you are also very honest uh, about the reality that it is not possible for you to, to know everything, to know everything, then you will allow yourself to to bring other people on board, uh, provided you see value in them. Mm -hmm. I always say that as much as we, this idea of capital, do a, a due diligence, the entrepreneurs should also do a due diligence on whoever they are going to ask money from. Mm -hmm. And that due diligence has to be informed by what is your vision for your business as an entrepreneur? Because not every financier or not every investor uh, is um, would, will be aligned with your vision. Mm -hmm. So if, for instance, you, you are looking to scale your business and you're looking for an investor who's going to help you to do that, then you come to people like us. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking to uh, get funding for your contract, uh, you probably then need to go to a bank. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? <laughs> I get the difference. Yes, so, because uh, it's important for people to, to to make the distinction between early stage investors or venture capital funders or private equity funders mm -hmm. or just debt funders. You need to understand where to go. Yeah, where to go. What are you looking for? And therefore, who can provide you what you're looking for? Um, I mean, we have a transaction we're trying to do now in the sort of end. Entrepreneurs said they want to do a DD on us. And we're yeah. like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we can give you access to our uh, to some of our portfolio companies if you want to know what kind of investor we are. We're more than okay. happy to do that. There's one thing that you said about you going to pitch and convince people that give me this two billion right. and I'm going to do this amazing thing with yes. it. And when you're saying it, I was thinking you are a judge in the dragon's den. Mm. So it, it, we never think that at, at some end, you also go and pitch. I'm an entrepreneur too. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur too. So yes, I have to pitch. Okay. I have to pitch. Um, yeah. What advice do you have for us when it comes to pitching? Because clearly you are doing it now. We used to think you're a judge. And then after we don't think of you pitching. We just think of you as a judge. I pitch when for you a living. see you on TV. <laughs> I pitch for a living. Um, what do people get wrong and what, what have you seen entrepreneurs get right? Um, I think it talks partly to what I already alluded to, which is um, understand who is the most appropriate um, investor you should talk to or funder you should talk to. Mm. So don't go and pitch to everyone, right? Do your, do your homework. Yeah. So what, what we do is... Uh, we typically uh, talk to uh, institutional investors and before we go and talk to them, we say, what is their investment strategy and philosophy and does it align with ours? Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in about 30 minutes time, I'll be pitching to the British investment, um, inter British international investment. Um, okay. Because when I spoke to the managing director, I met him somewhere in the world, uh, last year, he told me what their investment uh, thesis is, what, what they're looking for. Uh, so they said they're looking for gender lens investing, mm -hmm. uh, fund managers. They're looking for fund managers that focus on uh, SMEs. They're looking for fund managers that focus on Africans. I fit all and of that. And that's all of you. So, <laughs> yeah, and I wasn't even pitching. We are just having a conversation. So then he arranged that we should meet with his team. So today we're doing a formal pitch. Uh, and our pitch talks specifically to, to their, mandate. their mandate, yes. So you do your homework. You have to do your homework. 
in the past, um, for the, for, for, for the, I've been running this business now for almost 17 years, right? Mm -hmm. So for probably 15 of those 17 years, I knew there was no point in talking to pension funds mm -hmm. uh, because they were not interested in uh, early stage uh, businesses because we felt that it's too risky. And there was no proof of concept in yes. terms of success. But, but, but through, so what we then did is we spent a lot of time educating them about this mm -hmm. asset class. We're saying that it's not more risky than other asset classes. It's just, well, it might, it might be more risky, but there are ways that we mitigate, right? So we, we, yeah. did, so we did a lot of education first. And then by the time they said, ah, okay, well, now we get it. Now we're starting to pitch to them. We've just received an allocation from one of the largest uh, pension funds. Uh, uh, we, are, we are the first venture capital uh, fund to receive money, VC money from them because we've been educating all the time. So educate the people that you want to talk to. If you're wow. trying to convert them, yes. And, 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 and Do your homework, educate. Ed yes. And also, you know, when we were raising the, the 100 million US dollar fund that we referred to earlier, 102 million, it, it ended up being 102 million, but the target was 100 million US dollars. Um, we were doing it internationally, right? And it was two African women going to America, going to Europe, and the Americans could not, they could not fathom the very concept that African women can absorb a hundred million US dollars, you know? So we had to educate and we educated through the use of case studies to mm -hmm. say, no, no, actually it has been done before. You know, African women have built businesses that successfully, these are the faces, these are the names, this is what it looks like. So we, we, we invested a lot of time in educating. Um, you also need to understand your investors' um, risk appetite. Yeah. You need to understand some investors, for instance, are very sector specific, whereas others are sector agnostic. Okay. So you can't go to somebody who says, I don't do agriculture and then say, please can you fund my farm? My farm. You know, yesterday I got a call from a lady who said, oh, please, can you come and talk to uh, some women in tourism uh, on such and such a date? And I said, about what you do. So I said, I'll be wasting your time because I'm going to get everybody excited about or oh, IDF does funding, and then I know that we don't do tourism. We don't finance tourism. Mm. So let's not waste each, each other's time, you know? Uh, so, so you need to understand those things. Um, good. You also need to understand what their return requirements are. Okay. So if I say to you that if I give you one rand today, I want it back as three rand. You can't come to me and say, give me one rand um, uh, as a loan, and I'll give you one rand 20 back as 20% uh, interest. You're talking to the rope, like you're wasting my time. So, and get to that very quickly. One other thing that um, uh, people don't, <laughs> don't fully appreciate is that people in the financial services industry, we are called A-type people. Okay. Meaning that we are very impatient and our concentration span is very, very short. Or oh, get so to the get point. get to it. Don't come to me and present a 30-page uh, you know, business plan. PowerPoint presentation. No. So what we do, so I'm now speaking as a, as a, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. I've got what I call a teaser. It's two pages. Okay. Yeah. To what your appetite. Right. And in those two pages, I tell you who we are, what the team is, what our investment thesis is, what our track record is, what we're trying to raise in terms of uh, funding and what returns we'll give you. Does this interest mm. you? Uh, two pages. Then if they say, is oh. Is in PowerPoint? No, the, my, the, our teaser is in, mm -hmm. it's, it's written, but it's, it's okay. very graphic. Okay. Yeah, right? Because you have to, you, you know, you have to keep people's um, attention. Um, you know, you have, to, yeah, yeah. you have to capture their, their, attention. Their, their attention. Yes. And then once they say, oh, sounds interesting. Yeah. Then I come with my 20 page uh, pitch deck. <laughs> right? It's still very summarized, by the way. Yeah. And then once I've taken them through, because now I'm unpacking what the two pages were saying, right? And then once they say, okay, great. Now let's, let's, let's start this process. Then I've got a 75 page pitch deck. So that one is going to listen to this and use that process of yes. you here. Yes. No, no, that's, 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 and that's exactly what we, we even have, you know, for, for a lot of entrepreneurs who want to pitch, we have a template to say, if you don't know how to package it, here's a template. So that it's easy for us to also absorb uh, the, information the information because you then surface what is important for us to make a quick call on.
Because if it's now, if you're going to send me a 100-page document, I'm like, I'm not going to read 300-page document, then get to page 99 and realize that I'm not interested. We'll end it here. Yeah. Because you have to go to another yes. meeting. Where does someone go? I guess they can go to the IDF website to find out what types of businesses you, you help. Yes. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. I think we'll end it here. There will be events. Do you have events coming that we should look out for? The, 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 the flagship event that is coming up is on the 29th of October. We call it the Festival of Entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have fun. Yes. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much you. for your time. You. We're going to run a couple more podcasts with her. My word. I am looking forward to this. See you in the next episode.